Okay. Right. Well, good morning and welcome. I have to say it's really good to see so many people here at half past eight in the morning. Bit of an early start, I know. Last night, number of parties. But um, what we're going to do this morning is talk about streams in JDK 8. And we've kind of titled this The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And the idea of this presentation is really to sort of help you learn from my mistakes, not Stuart's, my mistakes. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at some samples of Streams code. And really, this is kind of tracking some of my learning process about Streams and understanding how you need to think differently. Because as Java programmers, we are very much focused on imperative programming. We understand the idea of loops. We understand the idea of mutable state. So we put things in variables. So if I ask, show of hands, who here thinks they're a Java programmer? OK, that's good. We have the right audience. Who here would describe themselves as a functional programmer? Yes, you see, there's only a few people here. And that's, that's the key thing here, is that functional programming is very different to imperative programming. And you do need to think differently. So we're going to give you some examples of how to not do things, as well as how to do things. And really, the sort of idea behind this presentation came about because I wrote a blog entry where I explained about how I'd done some things with streams. And somebody didn't like my code. And he kind of criticized it. And so we had a, a discussion about that. And so this is kind of how we came about this presentation. So the first, actually, I should introduce us, shouldn't I? <laughs> so I'm Simon Ritter. I work for Azul. I'm, I'm Stuart Marks. I work for Oracle on the JDK core libraries. Yes. So Stuart obviously has had a lot to do with the development of streams. Um, I haven't. OK, so the first thing was, was dealing with exceptions, because this actually is something which can be quite tricky when it comes to using streams, as we will see. Now, the problem that I had was I was trying to process some data that was coming through like a sort of web interface. And so the idea is you've got a very simple you know, key value set that you want to extract information from. So simple thing of you know, action is validate, key is 10, key is 22, key is 10, key is 33. So what I wanted was results in the form of action and validate, and then key where I had a set of values 10, 22, 10, and 33. So the important thing is that I could have duplicate values in the set that I've got. So that, that was actually quite a, an important point. So of course, the first thing I do is I go to Stack Overflow, and I say, has anybody faced this problem before? And I look around, and I find that, yes, somebody has produced a nice pe well, a piece of code which does this. Now, we're not going to talk about this, because this is, obviously, it's rather small. And um, it's actually not a very nice piece of code. Even I would, I would have to admit that there's a lot of things in this code that could be tidied up and improved. So we won't talk about that, other than to say that I looked at that, and I thought to myself, no, I don't want to do it that way. I want to use streams. So I came up with this. And the, the thing that I was really focused on, which I shouldn't have been, was making this as compact as possible. So I wanted to squeeze this into literally three lines of code. So as you can see here, I have come up with Perl, because it's rather dense, and it's not actually the best kind of code. So the, there are th three problems with this. And in fact, I, I came up with two problems, and then Stuart pointed out that there was a third problem associated with this. The three problems are that this can return a null. So that's you know, never a good idea, because if you return a null, then you're going to have to test for the null when you get the result and deal with it appropriately. So returning a null, not a good idea, especially since we have an optional in JDK 8. The second thing is that split, and this is the one that Stuart pointed out to me recently, split is called twice. So we're doing the same thing, calling split twice, and that's very inefficient. So we need to resolve that problem. And then the third thing is, it doesn't call the URL decode decode method, which is used in the original code. And the reason for that was because I didn't want to have to deal with the exception, because the problem is that decode throws a checked exception. And if you're using a stream and you're using the stream API, you can't throw an exception out of the stream method. So do you want to just? Yeah, a couple things on that. So, so one is, yeah, so the original code had this, had this interesting thing. And this isn't particularly about streams, but it's, it's, 
It's about general code, and as we improve the code in general, it actually makes streams much, uh, much nicer to deal with. But in, in this particular case, the, the original code accepted a null, and it had to test it, and if, it, uh, if the input was null, it returned null. And, and it's like everybody does that, and that's, that's sort of a strange thing to do if you think about it, because what you want is a value, which is a map from string to string, to list of string right? and you want to process those. And so if you have this, I, I think it's a bad coding habit. Trisha G wrote a, a blog post a few weeks ago at the uh, JetBrains. Uh, uh, she has a blog series about code smells where she talks about null. And it turns out the code base she was, she was working on, every method said, oh, if I get null, return null. And even if that didn't make sense at all, it was sort of a bad habit that was propagated throughout the code base. And I think that's kind of what's going on here. Because if you think, think about the context here, you're, you have a URL, and you want to grab the arguments off the end of the URL. So if there are any arguments, then that you, you have a non-empty string. If there aren't any arguments, then maybe you should have an empty string. But you should never have null. So where does null come from? Right? And then so if you, if you think about getting rid of nulls, you never return null. You should return an empty map instead, and then whatever needs to process it will process every entry of the empty map, which means it will just do nothing. So you, just, so you should really try to think about when you really need to process null and when it's just a bad habit of, oh, I better check for null and return null. Um, oh, and then one quick thing here, too. The original code uh, had a regular expression uh, in the split command, which actually slows it down quite a bit because it's all it's doing is matching a single character. So there's actually a fast path in the split method. It takes a regular expression, but if it says, oh, if I'm splitting on a single character, it goes through a completely different section of code that bypasses all the, the expensive regular expression processing. So it goes much faster. Good to know. Okay, so then, obviously, after a bit of discussion with, with Stuart, I came up with a, a better approach. And so the idea here is to, to extract some of the code out into a method. Here what we're going to do is we're going to split the key and the value and that way we can use the URL decoder decode method and we can deal with the exception but we have to do that in the method so we have to somehow deal with the exception, the checked exception in that method. And so you know, it, it's, it comes down to the design of the streams API and I've, I've spoken to Brian about this in the past. Um, about the Brian Getz. Yeah, Brian Getz, yeah. The designer of the streams API. Yeah. Um, about you know the, the way that you don't have the ability to throw an exception out of a stream because ideally what we'd like to be able to do is have a stream and then at some point something happens in a lambda expression you throw an exception and then that gets thrown out of the whole stream but it just doesn't work that way um, so what what we have to do is we have to have a method and in this case we have to do something in terms of dealing with that exception so we call the deco method it could potentially throw an exception in this case we're going to do a uh, a warning from the, the logger and will return a null. Um, the other thing about this is that it uses a JDK 9 enhancement which is map.entry. So map.entry will return you, well, a map entry. And the nice thing about that is that you don't have to use, there's a kind of um, a class which is buried in, what is it, abstract? Abstract map dot simple immutable entry. Yes, abstract map dot simple immutable entry, as opposed to the class which we should have, which is called tuple. And so, so we end up with this where we actually return a map dot entry and we get one which is a string and a string. So, so we extract out the code that needs to deal with the exception into a separate method. And then, in terms of actually making our code nicer, we end up with this where obviously we've made it a little bit bigger but it's much easier to read. So now we have the idea that we're going to parse the query, we, we create a stream based on splitting on the ampersand, and then we filter to ensure that we don't get any non -null, uh, any null objects. So that's a simple way of eliminating that problem of um, the, the null. Obviously, at that point, because we're calling objects dot require non null, if it's a null, it'll throw a null pointer exception, but that is at least a better way of potentially dealing with it. Did you want to say anything about that? Yeah. Or, yeah. Can you, when you're finished, can you okay. go back to the previous slide? Okay. Yep. So, um, so we, we eliminate the problem of having a null in terms of our value. Then we call the map, and we use our split key value, which is the one that we've extracted out the the code that deals with the exception. Then we fil filter that to say if that returns a null, then we just ignore anything because obviously that's not got the, the information we need, so we can eliminate that. And then we use a collect reduction, so we're grouping by 
the key and the value in generating a list. So it's, it's a lot clearer, a lot neater, a lot tidier than the three lines of code that I tried to write originally. So if I go back to the previous slide, then... Okay, yeah, a couple comments on this. So, so as, as Simon pointed out, the, 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 there's, a, there's a problem here because there's a mismatch between APIs in the JDK that throw checked exceptions and using those APIs in uh, streams, which generally do not allow checked exceptions. And so the sad thing about this is I went back and revisited this. this it's actually t t totally unnecessary to have a checked exception in this case. Uh, but the, the bug is actually in missing APIs in the JDK. So, so if you dig into this, what's going on is, so it's the URL decoder decode method throws this unsupported encoding exception. That's because you have to tell it what encoding it uses. And the way you tell it what encoding to use is by giving it the string name of an encoding. And um, so there's the possibility that the, the encoding for that string name that you give it is not present. And that's actually kind of an old-fashioned API. Those, those were introduced very early on in the JDK. Much more recently, a bunch of the APIs have been added. Uh, there's, a, there's a char set object, and there are char set constants, like char set dot UTF-8. And that's present everywhere. So there's this, oh yeah, somebody at the point said standard char sets, yes. So, um, so, um, so anyway, so the, those are guaranteed to be present in the JDK, and so if you use a char set object, then you can often call an API and pass the char set object, and it doesn't throw a checked exception. Unfortunately, there is no such overload for URL decoder dot decode, and also for encode. So really, what we need to do is fix up the APIs, and then this, this whole segment of the problem should go away. Um, and then there's another problem, which, which is, I, I'm not entirely sure, but if we're decoding the URL, the, the actual character encoding is, I think, officially unspecified, but it's usually UTF-8. So you might be able to get away, if you had a better API, you might be able to get away with specifying UTF-8 here. Then you avoid the whole checked exception. And in fact, then you could refactor the whole thing and, and it would get much nicer. But we do not have that option today. But uh, somebody remind me to file a bug for that. Okay. Um, one more thing. Oh, and then also there's this uh, split method. Uh, so, so basically that you essentially want key value pairs and we split on equals. And so there's this issue here, which is, uh, so we use the, the overload of split, which takes a limit argument. So that means if there are multiple equal signs in one string, we take the, the, the first chunk to the left of the first equal sign and call that the key. And the rest of the string is the value uh, even if it includes equal signs. But there's still a bug here, which is if the chunk we get has no equal sign, this will return an array of length one and actually will throw a array, yeah, array, array index out of balance yeah. exception. So, so anyway, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on in this code you have to think about. But uh, all right, well, but we should move on. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, did, did you want to talk about the second slide? Um, I think, uh, no, why don't you okay. just go on? Right, okay. So next thing is imperative streams. Um, if we can hold questions until the end. Yeah, no, if we, if, can we keep questions till the end? Because we've we got quite a lot to get through, so we don't want to kind of pause too much. Um, okay, so imperative streams. Now, this comes back to what I was saying about how, as Java developers, we tend to think imperatively. We think in terms of loops. And so when JDK 8 first came out, I decided to write some code that would scan through all the Java docs and find all the places where you had a method that returned a stream and all the places where you had a method that would t take an argument, which was a functional interface, and therefore I could use a lambda expression, because there was no kind of succinct list that was available. So I did that, and I thought, right, I'm going to use streams to write this code. And one of the bits of code I ended up with was where I wanted to count how many new, or how many class, um, sorry, how many methods there were which returned a stream. So I had a, a map of classes to methods, and so what I wanted to be able to do is go through that and count up how many there were. So I came up with this piece of code, and I said, okay, let's take our, our map, and then we'll, we'll get the class from that, and we'll create a stream from that. And then for each of those, I need to do something. So what I want to do is I want to print out the, the method, and then I want to count if this is a new method. So I thought to myself, okay, so I know that this could potentially be multi-threaded, so I'm going to use a long adder 
which is specifically designed for this type of situation, where you've got frequent writes and infrequent reads. So each thread gets its own instance of the variable. You can update them independently. There's no contention, no locking. And then when you need the result, it brings it all together. So I thought that's a really good thing to do. It was new in JDK 8. We'll use that. So I ended up with this very nice piece of code where I said, OK, take the stream, do for each, and then I'll take my method name, and then I'll print it out, and I'll check if it's new method, and then I'll increment it. OK. So I spoke to Stuart about this, and he said, ah, well, you see, that's not functional programming. This is very bad. This is not functional programming. So I thought, OK, I'll go away, and I'll have another go at that. So I thought, right, I don't need state in this in terms of external state. So what I'll do is I'll make it a little bit more complicated, and I'll come up with the idea that I create my stream, and obviously I should have shifted this out into a method, but I'll put it in here just to make it easier to see on one slide. And I'll say, take the method, and then I'll have a variable inside my Lambda expression, which is new method is 0. Then I'll print out the method, and then I'll check to see if it's a new method. If it is, I'll set new method to be 1, and then I'll just return new method. So I get a stream of 1s and zeros, and I add those up, and I get a count of how many new methods there are, which um, returns uh, will do what I want. So again, I showed this to Stuart, and he said, well, yeah, you see, this is, this is kind of a bit more functional. But it's not functional, because we've still got state involved. So even though we've taken the state internally, we're still modifying state. So strictly speaking, I mean, you know, as a function, it would work because you could apply the same input and get the same output no matter how many times. But there's still state being modified. So that's not the way to do it. So I thought, OK, I'll go away and have another go at this. And so I came up with a better way of doing it, which is almost functional, but not quite. So again, we take the stream, and then we use this, this handy little method called peak. Peak allows you to look at the elements of the stream as they go past. And as long as you don't modify them, you can, you can look at them and you can do something like print them out. So I could print out the, the method names as they were going past. And then I pass that to map to int. And no state involved in terms of having a variable. And I thought, right, I'll use the conditional operator. And I'll say, if it's a new method, return 1. Otherwise, return 0. So I still get my stream of zeros and 1s. And I sum those up, and I get my result. And then Stuart pointed out, well, actually, there's a slightly better way of doing that, which is to use a filter. So rather than um, you know, doing an if statement inside a map to int, why not use a filter? Because a filter takes a predicate, and a predicate is you know, an if statement. So we can do it that way, and we end up with filter m goes to is new method, and then we pass it to count rather than sum, and everything works. So this is all very good. So this looks, I think to myself, look, this is functional code. We have done really well here. And then Stuart said, no, it is not functional code. He said, strictly speaking, print line is a side effect. And if you're being purely functional, you can't have side effects. So I'm going to hand it over to Stuart to OK. Um, all right. So yeah, that was quite, a, quite an evolution there. And uh, I think that's true. And I think that I, I think peak, using peak for, for printing out logging is, is a fine thing to do. This is kind of a debugging thing. Um, I guess if you want to actually store the results somewhere, you probably should build them up in a data structure using a collector or something like that. Uh, we have examples of that later on. Um, but I, I just wanted to reflect on the, at the very beginning of this. I don't know if you want to wind back to the, to the first slide of this. Um, so you see that there's a lot of evolution of the stream going on here, and that one, okay. Um, so Simon started off with for each, and the, the, the problem with for each is that it's, it's the easiest stream function to understand, but it's actually probably one of the least useful ones, because I, 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 I think, I don't want to harp on you too much, but I think Simon fell into this trap, which is, well, looks, wow, there's, yeah. all this, there's all this weird stuff. Well, for each, well, I know what that does, so I'll start writing with for each. And the problem with for each is that it immediately leads you into side effects. And once you fall into the trap of side effects, then you really have to think differently about how to extricate yourself from that. And so that's what this exercise was about. So I think we have some more for eaches coming up later on in the uh, presentation yes, as well. Yes, we do. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and that's kind of, Stuart makes a really good point, because it's this whole idea of thinking differently. Because the way I looked at it was I said, OK, so I've got these elements coming through. And then for each of those, I want to do something. 
So immediately I've got those two words in there. For each of those, I want to do something. Oh, look, there's a for each method. I'll use the for each method. And that's not the way to do it. And the way I kind of explain this when I talk to people um, on other sort of lambdas and streams stuff that I do is like, if you think, if you look at for each and you think to yourself, oh, I use for each, stop and think, should I really be using that? Because there are legitimate situations where you can use for each. But there are many where you shouldn't. And so using it in a more functional way is, is the way to do that. So the moment you think about using for each, stop and kind of think about it very carefully to decide whether that actually makes sense. OK, so if we move forward to the next one. Right, mixing internal and external iteration. So again, you see, this is the problem of being a Java programmer and not a functional programmer. So here is the, the bad. So what I wanted to do was I had a set of data which was a number of values for each day of the year. And what I wanted to do was to group them into months so that I could build a graph of each month and then have a bar associated with each day so I could see how much data there was for that particular day. So I, went, I needed some way of grouping them by month and then having values for each day in that month. So I started off with a, a very simple piece of code where I said for int i equals 0 i less than 12 i plus plus. Good Java code, simple loop. And then I thought, right, so I've got my loop. I'm going to use a stream. So I put a stream inside my loop, and I'll say the days of the month for that month is the data that I've got. I'll create a stream, and then I'm going to filter it so that I say get the month and check to see if that compares against, and of course, in that case, you know, it's starting from 0 versus starting from 1. So we have to add 1 to i in order to get the appropriate month number. This is where things get a little bit complicated. So we check to see whether it's the right month. And then we say filter that to only get the data for that month. And then we collect it using a grouping by where we're getting the day of the month and then the count associated with that day of the month. So that, that generates what we need in terms of the, the map that we're creating. Now, if you look at that, OK, so that's a little bit odd, but it, it sort of, you think to yourself, okay, would that work? And the answer is no, it won't, for the simple reason that we're using i plus 1. Now, because we're in a stream, we're using a lambda expression, lambda expressions can only reference variables from the surrounding scope if they are effectively final. Now, because we're adding 1 to i, it is not effectively final, and also because i is changing, i is not effectively final. So we can't do that. So I looked at that and I thought to myself, hmm, how can we solve this problem? I know, I'll add one more line of code. I will set a new variable called i, and then I'll change the, the loop variable name, and I'll set i to be m. So then i is effectively final, and I can get away with that. You can notice that you know I'm not really a functional programmer here. So clearly at this point, i is now effectively final, and we can actually get away with um, adding one to that in that case. Um, so OK, that's really not the right way to do it. So what we should be doing is using internal iteration for both the, the, way, well, both of the sort of loops that we're doing here. So why don't we use streams for iteration? And so what I could do is I could do, OK, let's create a stream from int stream where we're going from 0 to 12. So that gives us a stream in the same way that we have our, our loop that goes from 0 to 12. We'll create a stream of ints which goes from 0 to 12. And then we'll use for each. Aha, are we using the right thing here? Immediately we have to ask ourselves. Probably not. And then what we do is we say, OK, take i, and then we'll say days of month i is, and then we go back to our stream for the data. So now we're looping through the data internally. And then we do the same thing we had before. So we have filter month of i plus 1, collect, same collector. So in this case, i is a valid reference, so we can get away with that. So this, this gives us some, you know, we're using itera internal iteration for both loops, but it's still pretty ugly code. So do you want to meet me go through, all the way through to the end and then? Yeah. yeah okay. Right. So then Stuart had a look at this and he goes, mm -hmm, OK, there's, there's some better things that we can do here. The first of those is to eliminate for each. So this is the thing. We don't want to be using for each in a situation like this. So what we actually do is we say, OK, we're going to create a map going from month to a map of integers and longs. So this is the, uh, the second, the internal map is the day of the month and the count associated with that month. And we'll create results. So we take our data and we stream it. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to map 
to the date. Okay, that's all good. So we get the date for that particular piece of data. And then we're going to collect, but the collect changes. So we use a, a, a more, um, a better way of, of doing the collector. So we say collect, we want to group by, and in this case, we're going to use zone date time get month. So we get the month associated with that. So we group by month. And then we're going to group by the day of the month. And then we're going to count. So this gives us exactly what we want in terms of a map, which maps from the month to the day of the month and a count associated with that month. And so that is obviously the better stream solution. So Stuart, do you want to? OK, so do you want this. To wind back um, uh, yeah, I'll tell you in a moment, okay. right? But let's look at this code for a moment. I think this is the, the nested grouping by, I think, throws a lot of people. And it, it's kind of hard to come out with, with a nested grouping by, uh, you know, right off the top of your head. Um, but um, I, I think the way to think about it is to build things up incrementally. So why don't we go back to the, to the very first slide that, that has, an, has the array? Okay. Uh, that, yeah, that's a fine one because that's yeah, that's logically the same thing. It just uh, yeah, that's the first the first code that that works because of the yeah. effectively final issue, right? So so what what's not on this slide is the declaration of this this array that's being assigned to, and so if you if you if you look at this carefully, it's it's an array that has to go that has that has to have twelve uh, twelve elements, and there's. It's, I think the array is actually misnamed, but it's basically an array element for each month. So the, the, the indexes into the array are 0 through 11, because that's what we're getting out of the for loop. And we're assigning something to each array element based on the month. And so that should think about this a little bit. So if you have an, oh, and then the element type of the array is whatever you get back from that stream. And so what we're doing here is we're collecting using grouping by. And so the result is. Uh, each element is a map, right? So that's yeah. that's our yeah. that's our count from the day of the month to sorry that's a map from the day of the month to the count. The count. Yeah. And so so in the inner in in so that's already you see the inner grouping by there. So so let's just say we're working on one month, right? So what this does is it goes through for that month for each day of the month uses the day of the month as as the grouping key, and then the count ends up in the value. So that's, that's where you get, that, that turns into your inner grouping by. But we wrap something around it, which is a for loop, which is for each month. But then the result is this array of, of entries per month, which is this map. And so if you think about an array this, in, in a different way, this is an array of maps, which, first of all, mixing arrays and generics is usually pretty bad. And I think you didn't include the declaration in the array because yeah. it's really ugly, because <laughs> yeah. you, you have to use unsafe casts in order to allocate it. But, but really, this, this should th start to tell you that maybe an array is not the right data structure for this. Because if you have an array going from 0 to 11, where each, each array index represents a month, and then you have a, a value stored in that array, that's actually a map. It's a map from a month to some value. And so that's where we get our outer map. And so instead of looping over the array, and actually kind of another thing that this does, this is, imagine this is a very large data set. This actually loops over the entire data set 12 times. And so uh, what, what we really want to do is take one pass over the array and say, ah, OK, which month does this belong in, and classify it. Now that we have some piece of data for this month, say, what day of the month is this? And so we, we're classifying it again. And then with that item, add one to that count. So we're doing these two levels of classification, first by month and, first by, and then second by day of the month. And that's where we get our two grouping bys. So, the, the, so if you change the data structure from an array to a map, and then you can say, oh, we're classifying by months. And whenever you're classifying by some value, that turns into a grouping by. That's where the outermost grouping by comes from. And so why don't, you, why don't we wind back to the, uh, to the last slide there, and you can, you can see that. So, um, so I think this, 
once once you under, once you've once you've you know bought into the idea of grouping by as classifying things into a map, then here we have you know you see the first grouping by is by month, second grouping by is by day of month, and then the count is the third thing. So you get this this um, I mean it's a little complicated, but it's this nested map structure. But it's much nicer than having an array of maps. I'll tell you that. Um, and the other nice thing is that if you remember the previous slides, we, we, well, what wasn't on the slide was the initial allocation of the array, and then the, what was in the intermediate code was assignments to individual array elements. And so, again, back to side effects inside of for each, right? So if we continue in that theme, we want to, we want to, um, we want to, uh, avoid side effects if possible and say, okay, how can we construct a value that has the right properties we want? And so that's what collecting does. So we have all of our stream elements, they run through this collector that does this nested classification, and it builds up this two-level map, and that's the result of our method. So no side effects in here. Good. Okay, so the next one is um, one of the things that we did in a hands-on lab, so Stuart and I in the past have, and uh, today or yesterday have run hands-on labs for streams where people get exercises that they can work through and they can and see how they work. And so one of those that I ran uh, last year, I think it was, was a, a simple exercise. And the idea was you had to concatenate the first character of each string in a list to generate a new string. So the input was Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo, Foxtrot. So what we were looking for was a way of getting A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, and the answer to that is not to use streams. It actually uses the for each method on the, is it iterable? Iterable interface? Um, so what we do is we create a string builder, and then we say input dot for each, and this is a legitimate use of for each. And we say append the character at zero to our string builder, yes. And then um, the result is simply to extract the string from the string builder, three lines of code, does exactly what it should do, and it works perfectly. So the, the thing that happened was I was doing this course, and somebody was asking a question. They said, well, OK, so that, that uses that. Could we do it with streams? And I said, well, yes, I suppose we could do it with streams. Let's do it this way. So we create a result where we take our input, we take the stream, we map. Um, I use substring 01 for this one. Um, so we map to the first character in the string, and then we reduce it. So we'll use a reduction. A reduction is where we, we take an initial value, which is an empty string, and then we use an accumulator, which says take the, the partial result A and the next element in the stream B and apply some accumulation to those. So in this case, we're just doing string concatenation. So I looked at that, and it was like, OK, well, that does solve the problem, but it doesn't do it in a very nice way, because even I can see that we're doing string concatenation there, so there's a lot of intermediate objects being created, and we'll have a, a situation where, if this was a large data set, it'd be very inefficient, certainly compared to the previous one. So then the question was, well, could we do it with a reduction using a string builder? So rather than you know, using a string concatenation operation, let's use a string builder. So I thought, right. Let's see if we can do that. And I came up with a piece of code to do that, which is it's, it's kind of interesting. So we create a new string builder, and then we say, uh, take the input stream, and then we'll map it to our substring, and then we'll reduce it. But this time, we'll use our string builder in the reduction, and we'll say that the accumulator is to append B, and then return that as a string. So that creates a new partial result by appending B to our string. So then we, the result, because it's an optional, we need to return what the value of the optional is. So who thinks that would work? OK, yes, good. <laughs> well, I'm obviously not going to ask that question if it did work, am I? Um, OK, so that, that fails. OK, anybody want to guess what the actual result is? No? Oh. Say again? Not a different order of letters. No, actually, what you get is B, C, D, E, F. And the reason for that is that if you look at the reduce there, you've got A and B, and I've conveniently ignored A. Now, A is the partial result. And when you first start processing the stream, the first partial result is the first element in that stream. So if you ignore the first partial result, then you don't get A in your, stri in your stream. You don't get the, the, what you need. So I thought to myself, I'm not going to be defeated by this. There is a way to do this using a string builder. So I came up with this. 
So I said, okay, let's be sneaky about this. Let's say if A, which is our partial result, has a length of one, that means it's the first element because it's only one character, then we'll append A to our string builder. Otherwise, we ignore that and we simply return uh, sb.append B to string. Great. And that actually gives you the right result. Clearly, that is probably not the best approach. So then we kind of discussed this further in the class and we said, okay, well, rather than using an explicit reduction, let's use a form of reduction, which is a collection. Okay. Now you can create your own collector. So what we could do is we could say, let's collect, and then we'll say collector.of, and we'll create a new collector. And the way you create a collector is you need to provide a number of components, if you like, to the, the uh, collector. So the first of those is the supplier. What are we going to collect into? So we'll say in this case it's a string builder, so we want to use, we want to generate a new string builder, so we use the um, the uh, constructor reference, that's what I'm looking for. Um, then you need an accumulator. So same as we're doing a reduction, so we need an accumulator. And in this case, we want to append the string to the string builder. Great. Then the third argument's a little bit odd because you need a combiner. And a combiner, in this case, is the same as the accumulator. The reason for having a combiner and an accumulator is that this potentially could be split into multiple threads. So each thread will use the accumulator to generate its particular result. And then the combiner is used to combine the results of each thread into a single result for the, the, the collection. So they could potentially be different, but in this case, they're, they're the same. And then you need a finisher, which is how you generate the result from the, the work that you've been doing. And in this case, we're just calling the two string on that. Now, that obviously works and uh, is, is fine, but there is actually a much simpler way of doing this, which is just to use collectors.joining. So use the, the existing collector. And in fact, if you look at the source code for collectors.joining, what you'll find is it's exactly the same as the previous slide. So uh, I ended up doing the same thing in, in essence. So Stuart, you want to? OK. Um, so can you wind back to the beginning of the scenario? Um, just a couple brief comments on this. Um, Previous one. One. Yeah. Previous one. Previous one. Okay. Uh, so th uh, the 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 segment of code at the bottom uh, is correct, as as Simon observed, but it is quite inefficient because this is um, this is this the string concatenation anti pattern, and so the the problem is that when you reduce this way, the intermediate result gets copied multiple times because it's producing <laughs> strings every time, and so if you have n strings input that are being concatenated this way, this turns into an order n squared problem. And so this is a very, very expensive way of, of concatenating strings. So that's why we added the, the, the joining method, because this is a common thing, and we, we don't want people to have to write uh, expensive algorithms like this. OK. Uh, why don't you go to the, to the really complicated one, a uh, couple. Oh, actually, yeah. That, so that one, yeah, I'll just reiterate here. Um, uh, Simon observed that uh, if you have a reduction function that doesn't use one of its arguments, it's very probably wrong. Um, and, and, and actually, but what, what you were trying to do there, which, which I've also seen before in other code, is that, well, the thing that leads you to not use one of the arguments is that you're doing side effects in it. Okay, right? And so again, this elimination of side effects or, or avoidance of side effects is something that we need to keep an eye on. Okay, so one, one more slide here. So, so another uh, one, one point about the reduction function is that it must be associative. And when we get to parallelism, that'll be, a, that'll be an issue. But um, don't have time to go into a full explanation of whether something is associative, but there are a lot of things that are. And if you have something that's slightly complex, it actually behooves you to go through a proof of, of whether it's associative. And if you have side effects in your reduction function, that proof becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible. So once again, side effects are, are to be avoided. OK, why don't we move on to the next scenario? OK. Yeah, yeah. I need to hurry a little. Yeah, I know. I, I think we're probably not going to get through everything in the end, but we'll. OK. Um, so we'll just do some quick performance examples. Um, so one is stream reuse, good or bad. So we've got a stream here of ints from 1 to 10, print those out. Um, so why don't we reuse it and do, you know, make life efficient, we'll reuse that. Um, anybody think that would work? Again, I'm asking a question which is probably not going to be. So the answer is no, because that will throw an illegal state exception because the stream has already, already been operated on or closed. So 
You can only use a stream once. That's the important thing about that. Um, second one, ah, which is better and why? So we've got points.stream, and then we're doing a filter, map, and, well, for each. And so we're using an explicit Lambda expression here to say that we want to get, is this point in view, invert the point, and then print it out. Same effective piece of code, functionally the same, stream, filter, but we, this time we're using the method reference rather than the uh, Lambda expression. So who thinks the top one is more efficient? Okay, who thinks the bottom one is more efficient? Ooh, okay, who thinks they're the same? Aha, okay. So the answer is that the bottom one is slightly more efficient. And the reason for that, um, actually, if you want to know more about that, you can come to my session this afternoon where I'm talking about lambdas explicitly. But the, the, the key point is that when a lambda gets compiled, it gets compiled in the, the body of the lambda expression needs to be put into a method that's associated with the, the place where it's used. And so if we have already a method reference, then you don't need to in put it into another method reference or another method. So it saves a level of indirection in, in essence. So that's why it's a little bit more, um, slightly better in terms of performance. Um, and then multi-sort, okay, so this is the, the bad way of doing things. So we, we, what we're looking at is we've got some patients, we've got some information about them, and so uh, we're saying, okay, if this is a valid record, then we want to sort by medication, then we want to sort by phys physician, then we sort, want to sort by name. So we do it in that sense. Um, the reality is that that would actually be much better if we do it using then comparing. So we do the same thing in effect, so we're still comparing based on, but we have to reverse the order as well. Um, name, physician, medication. So did you want to say, no, oh, okay, just move on from that. Uh, Parallel streams, okay, yeah, let's just talk about that briefly. Um, so parallel streams are faster, surely, because we're doing things in parallel, we must get a, a better, like, faster result. Unfortunately, that's not guaranteed. And the reason for that is that a parallel stream, you can guarantee that there's always going to be more work involved because you've got the fork join framework that's used underneath and what you have to set up the, the framework, you have to create the jobs that are associated with the queues for those threads, you have to do all the work and then you have to uh, collect the results at the end. So it's definitely going to be more work. It might happen or might complete more quickly. Uh, a couple of important facts about parallel streams are the fact that they use the common fork join pool. So there's a fork join pool that's created when the JVM starts up and they will all use, in terms of parallel streams, they will always use the fork join pool. In terms of the number of CPUs that that uses, it defaults to the number of cores or CPUs that is reported by the operating system. Some people will have said it's twice that number. Some people say it's that number plus one. If you look at the source code, it is actually the number of CPUs reported by the operating system. One point that's interesting about that is if you're using JDK 8, uh, I'm not sure if this is being backported, but if you're using JDK 8, that's not C group aware, which means if you're using a Docker container, and you run your JVM within that Docker container, when it sets up the fork join pool, and this is the same for the memory that it uses for the heap as well, it's going to get the results for the whole machine, not for the container. JDK 9 has had some changes, so JDK 9 on Linux is now container aware. Okay, so the last, last example very quickly, because we've got about two minutes. Um, nesting parallel streams, this is a really bad idea because we're using the same fork join pool, which means that although we have separate queues, so we don't get any corruption of data, we're trying to use the same set of threads to do the nested parallel stream, and you end up with uh, effectively worse performance because you're trying to reuse those threads. But so rather than having separate sets of threads associated with the different parallel streams, it's gonna be worse in, case of, in the case of performance. Um, there is, um, a way around this, which is you create your own uh, fork join pool. So you can actually create a fork join task uh, using a custom pool of, of how many threads you want, and then you submit your parallel stream task to that, and that will use a separate set of threads so you can potentially get better performance. But you had something to say about that, didn't you? Yeah, a couple of things about this technique here. So, so one is, if you find yourself wanting to use your own fork join pool, I think you should think very carefully about it. The first is that, um, this is really an implementation specific behavior, which is that if you submit a task to a fork join pool, any streams processing that's, that's done within that task will, will be executed in the same fork join pool. So that's, that's how this works. But that's not guaranteed by the spec. That's just how the implementation works today. 
Um, certainly, I mean, for all of JDK 8, it's worked that way. And it's, at this point, it's not going to change, but it might change in a future release. Um, the second thing is, uh, it's like, well, you might, you might think, okay, well, I'm going to want to control this, so I'm going to create my own fork join pool. But you should be very careful because if you start creating fork join pools all over your code and they have hard coded constants in here, you know, somebody's going to run this on a 24 core machine and saying, why am I only going to get 4x speed up? Uh, so, or, Somebody runs it on a few core machines, and there's thread contention going on because everybody's created his own fork join pool, each of which thinks it owns the whole machine or container or whatever. So, I mean, this, this is a valid technique if you're experimenting and if you're very, very careful about how you deploy it. But um, it's something to, many things to be careful about here. So, okay. So, so that is basically it. So, uh, in, in conclusion, streams are very powerful, but with great power comes great responsibility. And the important thing that hopefully you got from this is try not to think imperatively. Try not to think in terms of loops because whenever you think of for each, you need to step back and say, is that the way that you should do it? And as Stuart has said several times during the presentation, side effects are the things to be avoided. Uh, if you can avoid those at all costs, then, then do so. Um, Part of this, the, the power of streams is the clarity of the code. Don't be tempted like I was to go and try and squash everything into the smallest possible number of lines. Um, make it readable, make it understandable by other people. And as we just explained, parallel doesn't necessarily mean faster. Um, so I think that that's, you know, you've got a couple of words. Yeah. Key, key takeaway, if you find yourself writing for each with side effects, look at collectors. Ah, great. So thank you very much.